Get ready, because today we're gonna talk about Phantom Menace and how its problems run much deeper than Jar Jar. By the way, my name is Brandon McNulty, I'm the author of The Half Murders, and welcome to my writing channel. Last month, I did a video on how Jar Jar Binks failed as a comic relief character, and in preparation for that video, I rewatched episode one for the first time in forever. Now, I didn't expect it to be great, but I was shocked at how unbearable this movie is from start to finish. Sure, Jar Jar is a problem, but to be fair, removing him him or toning him down wouldn't have saved Phantom Menace. There's a lot wrong with this movie. It's been bothering me and I need to get it out of my system. So today we're going to look at three writing related issues that wrecked episode one. First issue is overdone world building. When we talk about world building, we're talking about bringing a story's universe to life with carefully chosen details. Those details might involve the story's setting, its history, its populations, and its power structures, among other things. When done right, world building should be a two-way street involving both the creator and the audience. The writer sprinkles in small yet critical details, and those details help the audience imagine a larger universe beyond what they see on the screen or on the written page. In short, world building makes a story feel larger than it actually is. Unfortunately, The Phantom Menace leans way too hard into world building. One thing people often criticize is the idea of midi-chlorians, which are the movie's explanation for how the Force works. Rather than allowing the Force to be this unique and spiritual energy field, Phantom Menace takes the magic away and reduces it down to a scientific concept. Not only are the info dumps themselves boring, but they shut down the audience's imagination and make the Star Wars universe feel smaller. The other big world building issue is the situation with the trade routes. If you remember, the Trade Federation drives the conflict when they blockade and later invade Naboo. This is all part of Palpatine's plan to gain power, and while this doesn't necessarily make for a terrible plot, the world-building details become suffocating. Early on, we get too many details and not enough reasons to emotionally connect with what's going on. I mean, do you care about the galactic trade routes? And yet, the story opens by focusing on trade disputes instead of the characters who are affected by them. Remember how accessible the world building was in the original Star Wars? The reason for this is because the original does the legwork of getting us invested in characters before throwing world building details at us. Right off the bat, we meet interesting people who represent both sides of the conflict. That helps us get invested in the story, and from there we learn what's at stake, we take in more details bit by bit, and we get a memorable demonstration of why the stolen data tapes are so important. Now compare that to episode one. At the start, we're expected to absorb tons of information. There's all this talk about trade routes and how Naboo will be affected, but why should we care about Naboo? We don't get invested in anyone from there until later, and this makes it harder to engage with the conflict. And although we might understand what's going on in this story world, the early details overpower the characters and flatten the emotion. That brings us to Phantom Menace's second problem. It has a shallow, lifeless cast. Not just in terms of the characters' personalities, but also their individual journeys. Personality-wise, everyone not named Anakin or Jar Jar is a walking sleep aid. Now, don't get me wrong, it's okay to have severe or stoic characters, but when most of the main cast brings the same energy, that's an issue. To make matters worse, these characters don't offer much beyond their personalities. Palpatine is the exception here because he's a schemer, he manipulates everyone in his quest for power, but aside from him, there's not much going on here. Qui-Gon is pretty cool on the surface, but his actual character is lacking. He's intent on rescuing Anakin from slavery, and training the boy, and this leads both of them to their eventual downfalls. Not a bad start, but my problem with Qui-Gon is that I always wanted more backstory out of him. Like, what drives this guy? Why is he so hell-bent on training Anakin, even when the Jedi Council refuses his request? The movie doesn't clue us in, and he feels shallow as a result. Obi-Wan, meanwhile, is about as exciting as office work. Aside from his big moment at the end, he doesn't do much other than spin around and deflect gunfire. He's a Padawan who wants to complete his training, and for a good chunk of the movie, he rots away on the ship while other characters advance the plot. Next, we have Padme, who, despite her bland personality, is probably the best character outside of Palpatine. She's a queen who disguises herself as a handmaiden for her own safety, and this enables her to experience the world firsthand rather than sitting around a royal chamber. Though she spends much of the movie in the background, she later leads an effort to recapture the throne room while displaying skill and resourcefulness in the process. Then we have Darth Maul, who's arguably the most stylish character in the entire film franchise. Trouble is, that's all he has. He's just style and nothing else, and he ends up being a throne 
throwaway villain. Then there's Anakin. He's portrayed as this innocent, compassionate kid, which is supposed to make his tragic downfall even more tragic. But ultimately, this portrayal leaves him feeling one-dimensional. It would have helped if there was more darkness to his character, but we don't get that here. And it's a shame because even a little foreshadowing could have gone a long way. Finally, you have everyone else, including the Jedi Council, the Trade Federation, the Gungans, Padme's decoy, Anakin's mom, Watto, Sebulba, R2, and 3PO. There are tons of characters crammed into this movie, and it leads to the age-old problem of quantity over quality. Cutting or combining some of these people would have allowed more time to develop the ones that actually matter, but in the end we're left with more characters than development. Finally, the third mistake is Phantom Conflict. Episode 1 is full of this, and in several key moments the movie plays out like a video game that beats itself. Anytime an overwhelming obstacle threatens the characters, you can bet that convenient timing or a lucky coincidence will come to the rescue. For example, early on there's a scene where Qui-Gon, Obi-Wan, and Jar Jar are traveling in a submarine, and a giant sea creature attacks their ship. Jar Jar panics, but both Jedi act like it's no big deal, probably because they read the script and saw that a larger creature would eat their attacker. There's always a bigger fish. This is a terrible scene and a blown opportunity. It could have juiced up the story with an exciting chase sequence, or it could have allowed the Jedi to come up with a clever solution, but instead the conflict eats itself. Then you have the movie's final act, which is full of phantom conflict. Remember when the droid army threatens to wipe out the Gungans? Well, don't worry, because luck and coincidence repeatedly come to the rescue. Not only does Jar Jar kill numerous enemies with his Looney Tunes routine, but Anakin also plays an unexpected role in the battle. See, the key to winning is destroying the droid's heavily guarded control ship. Anakin ends up doing just that, not because he has a plan or any intention of doing so, but because he accidentally triggers his ship's autopilot function, which takes him to the control ship, where he gets trapped inside and unintentionally destroyed. Destroys it. Finally, you have the duel between Obi-Wan and Darth Maul, which is intense and compelling until Maul has the high ground. From there, he somehow loses by allowing Obi-Wan to jump up and kill him. I mean, first of all, why doesn't Maul use the Force to push Obi-Wan to his death or throw something at him? And even if Maul is too dumb to figure this out, why don't his reflexes allow him to react to Obi-Wan's attack? If Maul can fight two Jedi at once, he should be able to see it coming when Obi-Wan leaps 20 feet in the air and grabs a lightsaber from across the room. I mean, come on, this fight deserves a better ending. And this franchise deserves better writing. So I hope this helps. Question of the day, what frustrated you most about The Phantom Menace? Or what frustrated you most about the Star Wars prequels in general? Let us know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. If you want to support the channel, please pick up a copy of any one of my books and be sure to leave reviews on Amazon. The Half Murders is great if you like horror stories. It's about a woman and her daughter who enter a haunted house. They get chopped in half, and for them, the nightmare is only beginning. Also, be sure to check out my other videos, like, share, and subscribe, maybe support me on Patreon, and as always, remember to keep on writing.